Well, Bill Marine mentioned that uh, you'd, you'd lived through a whole bunch of amateur radio regulatory groups uh, in this country. Yes. Um, and before the meeting started, you and I were talking about your service in World War II. And uh, I said I'd heard a rumor about you and Iwo Jima and stuff. And you were, you were starting to tell me about uh, your, your oh, World oh, yes. War II experience. Yes. I uh, I uh, went in the Signal Corps. I volunteered and went in, and I got a commission. And the commission was just about right for me in the Signal Corps. Signals, the uh, electronics training group, where I would go around and train people in electronics. I was married and had a baby about uh, five months old. So this was ideal. And I, I did take that position. and. Uh, they were very kind to me. The first thing they did, they sent me to Harvard University to study radio. I didn't think I needed that, but uh, it served a good purpose. <laughs> and then after that, they sent me to MIT to learn radar. Radiation lab, World right. War II. Yep. yep. And uh, finished that. Then I went out in the field and I studied all the radars and help people with their radars and so on and so forth. It was interesting. My wife accompanied me all the way with a baby that was allowed, and uh, the military paid for it. So wow. it was a rather good assignment. After several months of that, I, I uh, had some leave time. So I thought I'd take my wife home with her mother and four sisters. and. Uh, and as I was about to leave, a sergeant came running for the signal office saying, hold on, Lieutenant, you're going to the West Coast. We just heard from Washington. I said, I wonder why I can do all the things I'm doing here as well as on the West Coast. So I got on a troop train and ended up in San Francisco. Got orders to go to the state of Washington and the, the port where they shipped soldiers overseas and uh, i forget the name of that city now <laughs> we we were on uh, the, the ship was on dry dock and we had a big consulate hut and there were dentists and doctors and uh, people like that and myself we became good friends but we didn't have any money we sent it all home to our wives we thought we we're going overseas and, didn't realize about the ship being in dry dock. So we, we studied the situation, found out that the longshoremen paid the best. And if you work nights, they paid even more. So we, we had to join the union, which we all did. I'm a, I'm a member of the union ship. <laughs> <laughs> still. <laughs> I still have the card. <laughs> Excellent. Anyway, we, we did our work. We, we shoved empty 50 gallon, gallon drums down the causeway. We did it at night and uh, it wasn't very hard work. Finally, our dry dock was, was completed with our ship and uh, we all got on the ship. We didn't know where we were going because nobody ever was told where they were going. Yep. Was this a transport ship or a... Uh, it turned out to be a very, very fine new ship built up in, uh, in uh, northern Europe. So we got on there and uh, the doctors and the dentists and myself, we all stuck together. After oh, seven or eight days of traveling on the ocean, I looked up and saw a big massive piece of land there. And in another few days, I looked up and this is Diamond Head. We're going to Hawaii. <laughs> there I met the outfit that I was to be with, 3116th Signal Service Battalion. A, a general met me there. When I arrived, he said, take two weeks off, enjoy yourself, get to know around the island, and I'll be in touch with you. I thought pretty complimented that there was a general to that. So I did that and I enjoyed it very much. After two weeks, I went into the general's office and he sat me down. He said, I know why you joined the army and I don't want to change that unless you are willing. But he said, I have some very important work that I know you can do. 
I said, well, General, if you got work for me to do, I'm, I'm for it. I didn't join the military to sit on my rear end, and I like to get doing something. So he says, all right, go out to our radio station at the other end of the island and uh, spend a few months there. I did. Met all the people, made a lot of friends, studied all the equipment and uh, how things worked there. After a few months, a general called me back in. He said, we were worried about having our radio station above ground. After all, the Japanese could visit us again like they did in Pearl Harbor. And, uh, so we dug a tunnel in the mountainside here. And uh, I want you to install all of our transmitters in the tunnel. I did that. I ran all the cables and put the transmitters together, tuned them all up and got everything going good. General called me in again. He says, do you see that map on the wall, that picture on the wall? I said, yes, General, it looks like an island. He said, well, that's Iwo Jima. I'd never heard of Iwo Jima. He says, we're having trouble with our B-29 bombers. They're taking off from Tinian and places like that, and it's, it ends up with about a thousand miles round trip for these uh, B B-29s. Our crews are getting tired out and our equipment is wearing out. So we had to take Iwo Jima and bring our airplanes in there, which is only 700 miles from Tokyo. But he said, I want you to go in there and build a radio station for the Army. The Army is out of touch with Washington and every other place. If somebody gets killed, a soldier, uh, they can't tell the family about it because they don't have any contact with Washington or any other place. So this was my job to build a radio station that will reach the Pentagon, San Francisco, and the Orient. And it was a great sight when the B-29s lined up in Iwo Jima and uh, they were there. That's what we were supposed to do. Got the radio station all built and worked fine. <clears throat> I had a crew of 12 men with me, and I spent half my time protecting them from the Japanese and the rest of the time uh, working. Their job was to run transmission lines from the transmitter shack, and they had to dig holes in the ground, put these big poles in to mount the wires on. They did a good job because I had the privilege of picking out the men I wanted to be in my crew. They were good men, did a wonderful job. First night, it was the day after the flag was raised, our ship pulled alongside of Iwo Jima and we, we stood on the deck and watched all the dust flying, the flamethrowers going, bombs going off, rifles, it was sort of a hell when you think about it. Anyway, so I asked the captain, are we going in there tomorrow? He said, yes, you are, tomorrow morning. <laughs> My men were all seasick, all the way on the trail. I used to visit them every day, and uh, they looked like they were green in color. <laughs> but they sobered up in a hurry. So I was the first one down the rope ladder, and uh, I mounted the uh, landing ramp. Little, little rough thing to do because the ship goes this way and the landing craft goes its own way. So you have to wait sort of until they get in. Worked all right. I stumbled around a bit, but I made it. Then I helped my men. They stumbled around a lot and I helped them. <laughs> we all had heavy packs on our back, a rifle on our shoulder. and We got tired in a hurry, you know, with all that big load because we weren't the only people on this craft. There were a bunch of Marine soldiers and uh, many other people. So we finally landed on uh, right under the high ground of the island. This was a volcanic island, and the only high ground is where the volcano was spouted from. And the flag was raised, and it was the day after that we landed there, after the flag was raised. I had them all dig foxholes, and we unfortunately had to shoot a Japanese the first night. He came around the place. I heard pattering feet, and 
I said, that's strange. Our, our people are all warned. Don't to get it. Not, don't get up at night. You get shot by your own men. But he came by, and a few minutes later, a rifle went right off near my shoulder. I got up in a hurry, and uh, my sergeant was putting on a wristwatch from a Japanese soldier. He had a hand grenade in one hand and one in his pocket. I think he was there because he's looking for water. There was no fresh water on Iwo Jima. The Army had distills. We used the ocean water and distilled it. We had plenty of good water, but the Japanese did not. So they can only last a short time. There's no, no fresh water on the island at all. Well, I set to work. The, the uh, CBs did a great job for us. They built the towers for the antennas. They built the housing for all the transmitters, which were good. They had a power plant right alongside of the building. And the CBs don't get enough credit for what they're doing. Helped me a lot. So I went ahead putting together all the transmitters, testing them out, running the cables from the power plant. I'm the only one who knew much about radio there. Every time somebody needed help with the radio, they'd call on me. So I continued working on the radio, and the men kept digging holes and running the feed line. This was open wire line under tension, right? What's that? Uh, open wire line under tension from pole oh, to pole. Oh, yes, yeah, a lot yep. of tension there. Yep. And, uh, so we needed these big poles and, yep. to hold it. They did a good job. These guys in civilian life, the crew that I had, I chose because they were electrician guys that did pool work and, and civilian work, telephone work. So we did went along pretty good. I got the transmitters all working and in about uh, six months, my job was finished there. And it was a great, great thing to watch the B-29s all lined up. They were big crafts. Yes. And I, I, I firmly believe that we could have won the war with those B-29s flying 700 miles into Tokyo. They had double loads of, of bombs, and uh, they were just tearing Tokyo apart. You hear a lot of things about the atomic bombs. They didn't do anything. They were dropped about 70 miles or something like that from Tokyo. So they didn't do a darn thing. They just killed a lot of civilians. Millions of civilians were maimed for, maimed for life because of those bombs. Didn't help our war effort at all. But that's, that's not what you hear from the newspapers and so on. After a while, the, the Navy got fed up and they took a battleship into Tokyo Harbor and they just shelled that place day in and day out. And finally, the emperor, he said, enough, enough, we surrender. And that's how the war ended. Part of what did Tom Brokaw call him? America's greatest generation. Thank you for that story. Oh, you're very welcome. And you can come help me with my open wire lines anytime you want. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much.